on the Buddha's behavior. On the 18th day of the first intercalary month of the fifth year of Bunaye, 1268, an official announcement arrived from the Great Mongol Empire in which those barbarians of the West declared their intention to attack Japan. My prediction in the Risho Ankoku Ran, which I wrote in the first year of Bunno, 1260, has been completely fulfilled. My prophecy has surpassed even those in the Yu Fu poems of Po Chu Ai or the prophecies of Shakyamuni Buddha. Can there be anything more wondrous in this, the latter day of the law? If our land were ruled by a wise and virtuous sovereign, the highest honors in Japan, the title of great teacher, would be bestowed upon me. I had expected to be consulted about the Mongols, invited to the war council, and asked to defeat them through the power of prayer. However, since that did not happen, I sent letters of warning to eleven of our country's leaders in the tenth month of the same year. If there were a wise leader among us, he would immediately think, what a wonder. What unusual foresight, the deities Tensho Daijin and Hachiman must be offering a way to save Japan through this priest. In actuality, however, government officials slandered and deceived my messengers. They ignored or refused to reply to my letters, and even when they did reply, they purposely neglected to report the matter to the regent. Their behavior was highly irregular. Even if the letters concerned only some personal matter of mine, those in the government should still report it to the regent, as is only proper for an official. However, the letters were a warning of dire things to come that would affect the destiny of not only the regent's government but every other official as well. Even if they did not heed my warning, to slander my messengers was going too far. All Japanese, high and low, have for a long time now shown hostility toward the Lotus Sutra. Disaster after disaster has befallen them, and they have become possessed by devils. The Mongols' ultimatum has deprived them of the last remnants of sanity. In ancient China, Emperor Chou of the Yin dynasty refused to listen to the admonitions of his loyal minister Pai Khan and in a rage had Pai Khan's heart cut out. Later his dynasty was overthrown by kings Wen and Wu of the Chou. King Fu Cha of the state of Wu instead of heeding the remonstrances of his minister Wu Su Shu, forced the latter to commit suicide. Eventually Fu Cha was killed by King Ko Qian of the state of Yu. Thinking how tragic it would be if our country should meet the same fate, I risked my reputation and life to remonstrate with the authorities. But, just as a high wind creates high waves or a powerful dragon brings forth torrential rains, so my admonitions called forth increasing animosity. The regent's supreme council met to discuss whether to behead me or banish me from Kamakura and whether to confiscate the estates of my disciples and lay supporters, or to imprison, exile or execute them. Hearing of this, I rejoiced, saying that I had long expected it to come to this. In the past, Sesen Doji willingly offered his life to learn half a verse, Bodhisattva Jotai gave everything he had, Zenzai Doji threw himself into a fire, Gyobo Banji tore off a piece of his own skin, and Bodhisattva Yukuo burned his own elbow, all in order to attain enlightenment. Bodhisattva Fukio was beaten with sticks, Aryasena was beheaded, and Bodhisattva Kanadeva was killed by a Brahmin, all because of their propagation of Buddhism. These events should be considered in terms of the times and circumstances in which they occurred. Tian Te declared that the practice should accord with the times. His disciple Chong and interpreted this to mean, you should distinguish between Shoju and Shikubuku and never adhere solely to one or the other. The Lotus Sutra represents a single truth, but its practice and propagation vary according to the people in the time. Shakyamuni Buddha states, After my death, during the beginning of the latter day of the law that follows the two millennia of the former and middle days, a person will appear who will propagate the heart of the Lotus Sutra, the five characters of the Daimoku. At that time an evil king will be in power and evil priests, more numerous than particles of dust, will contend with one another over the various Mahayana and Hinayana sutras. When the votary of Daimoku challenges these priests, they will incite their lay believers to abuse, beat or imprison him, to confiscate his lands, to exile or behead him. In spite of such persecutions, he will continue his propagation without ceasing. Meanwhile the ruler who persecutes him will be beset by rebellion, and his subjects will devour each other like hungry demons. Finally the land will be attacked by a foreign country, for the Buddhist gods Bantan and Teishaku, 
the gods of the sun and moon, and the four heavenly kings ordained that other countries shall assault a land that is hostile to the Lotus Sutra. None of you who declare yourselves to be my disciples should ever be cowardly. Neither should you allow concern for your parents, wives or children to hold you back, or be worried about your property. Since the infinite past you have thrown away your life more times than the number of dust particles on earth in order to save your parents, your children or your property. But you have not once given your life for the Lotus Sutra. You may have tried to practice its teachings to some extent, but whenever you were persecuted, you ceased to live by the Sutra. That is like boiling water only to pour it into cold water, or like trying to strike fire but giving up halfway. Each and every one of you should be certain deep in your hearts that sacrificing your life for the Lotus Sutra is like trading rocks for gold or filth for rice. Now we are at the beginning of the latter day of the law and I, Nichiren, am the first to set out on the worldwide propagation of Myoho Renge Kyo. These five characters are the heart of the Lotus Sutra and the source of the enlightenment of all Buddhas. During the more than 2200 years that have passed since Shakyamuni entered Nirvana, no one has ever embarked on this mission, not even the greatest of his followers, Mahakashyapa, Ananda, Ashvagosha, Nagarjuna, Nan Yu, Tian Te, Miao Lo or Dengyo. My disciples, form your ranks and follow me, and you shall surpass even Mahakashyapa or Ananda, Tian Te or Dengyo. If you quail before the threats of the rulers of this little island country and abandon your faith, how will you face the even more terrible anger of Emma, the king of hell? You have proclaimed yourselves to be the messengers of the Buddha, but if you falter, there will be no one more despicable than you. While the regent's government could not come to any conclusion, priests of the Jodo, Ritsu, Shingon and other sects, who realized they could not surpass me in religious debate, sent petitions to the government. Finding their petitions unaccepted, they approached the wives and widows of high-ranking officials to vilify me. The women reported the slander to the officials, saying, according to what some priests told us, Nichiren declared that the deceased officials Hojo Tokiori and Hojo Shigetoki have fallen into the hell of incessant suffering. He said that Kencho-ji, Jufuku-ji, Gokuraku-ji, Koraku-ji and Debutsu-ji temples should be burned down and high priests such as Doryu and Ryokan beheaded. His statements prove that he is guilty on every account, and even though the regent's supreme council has been unable to decide on his punishment, he should be called to confirm whether or not he made these statements. Thus, I was summoned to the court. At the court, the magistrate said, you have heard what the regent stated. Did you or did you not say those things? I answered, every word is mine except the statement that the late officials Hojo Tokiori and Hojo Shigetoki have fallen into hell. Yet I most, certainly have been exposing the heresies of the sects they followed when they were alive. Everything I said was with the future of our country in mind. If you wish to maintain this land in peace and security, it is imperative that you summon the priests of the other sects for a debate in your presence. If you ignore this advice and punish me unreasonably, the entire country will regret your decision. If you condemn me, you will be rejecting the Buddha's envoy. Then you will have the punishment of Bantan and Teishaku, the gods of the sun and moon, and the four heavenly kings. One hundred days after my exile or execution, and again on the first, third and seventh anniversary, there will occur what the sutras call, internal strife, rebellions in your clan. These will be followed by foreign invasion from all sides, especially from the west. Then you will regret what you have done. Hearing this, the magistrate Hei no Saman, forgetting all the dignity of his rank, became wild with rage like Taira no Kiyomori. On the night of the twelfth day of the ninth month in the eighth year of Bunei, 1271, I was arrested in a manner which was extraordinary and unlawful, even more outrageous than the arrest of Ryokan and the priest Ryoko who had actually rebelled against the government. Hei no Saman led hundreds of armor-clad warriors to take me. Wearing the headgear of a court noble, he glared in anger and spoke in a rough voice. These actions were no different from those of the Prime Minister Taira no Kiyomori, who seized power only to lead the country to destruction. I immediately recognized the dire portent of this event and thought to myself, I expected something like this to happen sooner or later. How fortunate that I can give my life for the Lotus Sutra. 
If I am to lose this worthless head for Buddhahood, it will be like trading sand for gold or rocks for jewels. Shofu Bo, Hei no Seiman's chief retainer, rushed up, snatched the fifth scroll of the Lotus Sutra from inside my robe, and struck me in the face with it three times. Then he threw it on the floor. Warriors seized the nine other scrolls of the sutra, unrolled them and trampled on them or wound them around their bodies, scattering the scrolls all over the matting and wooden floors until every corner of the house was strewn with them. I said in a loud voice, see how insanely Hei no Seiman is acting. You all have just toppled the pillar of Japan. Hearing this, the assembled troops were taken aback. When they saw me standing before the fierce arm of the law unafraid, they must have realized that they were in the wrong, for the color drained from their faces. Both on the 10th, when I was summoned, and on this night, the 12th, I fully described to Hei no Seiman the heresies of the Shingen, Zen and Jodo sects, as well as Ryokan's failure in his prayers for rain. As his warriors listened, they would burst into laughter, and other times they grew furious. However, I will not go into the details here. Ryokan prayed for rain from the 18th day of the 6th month to the 4th day of the following month, but my power held his prayers in check. Ryokan worked himself into a sweat, yet nothing fell save his own tears. No rain fell in Kamakura, but on the contrary, strong gales blew continually. At this news, I sent a messenger to him three times, saying, if one cannot get across a river ten feet wide, how can he cross one that is a hundred or two hundred feet? Izumi Shikibu, an unchaste poetess, violated one of the eightfold precepts by writing poetry, but still she caused rain with a poem. The priest Noin was successful in bringing rainfall with a poem although he broke the precepts. How is it possible then that hundreds and thousands of priests, all of whom observe the 250 precepts, gather to pray for rain and can do no more than cause a gale, even after one or two weeks of prayer? It should be clear from this that none of you will be able to attain Buddhahood. The priest Ryokan read the message and wept in vexation, and to others he reviled me. When I reported what had happened with Ryokan, Hei no Seiman attempted to defend him, but it was hopeless. In the end he was unable to utter a word. That night of the twelfth, I was placed under the custody of Hojo Nobutoki, lord of the province of Musashi, and around midnight was taken away to be executed. Entering Wakamaya Avenue, I looked at the crowd of warriors surrounding me and said, I will not cause any trouble. Don't worry, I merely wish to say my last words to Bodhisattva Hachiman. I got down from the horse and called out, Bodhisattva Hachiman, are you truly a god? When Wake no Kiyomero was about to be beheaded, you appeared as a moon ten feet wide. When the great teacher Dengyo lectured on the Lotus Sutra, you bestowed upon him a purple surplus. I, Nichiren, am the greatest votary of the Lotus Sutra in Japan, and entirely without guilt. I have expounded the law to save all people from falling into the hell of incessant suffering for opposing the Lotus Sutra. Moreover, if the forces of the great Mongol Empire attack this country, can even the Buddhist gods Tensho Daijin and Hachiman remain safe and unharmed? When Shakyamuni Buddha expounded the Lotus Sutra, Taho Buddha and many other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas appeared shining like so many suns, moons, stars and mirrors. In the presence of the countless Buddhas and gods of India, China and Japan, the Lord Buddha urged each Buddhist god to pledge to protect the votary of the Lotus Sutra at all times. Each and every one of you Buddhist gods made this pledge. I should not have to remind you. Why are you not here to fulfill your oath now that the time has come? Finally I called out. If I am executed tonight and go to the pure land of Eagle Peak, I shall report at once. To Shakyamuni Buddha that Tensho Daijin and Hachiman have broken their oath to him. If you feel this will go hard on you, you had better do something about it right away. Having spoken, I remounted my horse. As the party passed the shrine on Yui Beach, I spoke again. Stop a minute, gentlemen. I have a message for someone living near here, I said. A boy called Kamau was sent to Shio Kingo, who rushed to meet me. I told him, tonight, I go to be beheaded. This wish I have cherished these many years. This world has seen pheasants born only to be caught by hawks, mice born only to be eaten by cats, and men born to be killed attempting to avenge the murder of their wives and children. Such things have occurred more times than there are specks of dust on earth. But until now, 
no one has ever lost his life for the sake of the Lotus Sutra. I myself was born to become a poor priest, unable fully to repay the debt of gratitude I owe to my parents and to my country. Now I will present my severed head to the Lotus Sutra and share the blessings therefrom with my parents, and with my disciples and believers, just as I have promised you. Then the four Shio brothers, holding on to my horse's reins, went with me to Tatsunokuchi at Koshigo. Finally we came to a place that I knew must be the site of my execution. Indeed, the soldiers stopped and began to mill around in excitement. Shio Kingo, in tears, said, These are your last moments. I replied, How thoughtless you are. You should be delighted at this great fortune. Don't you remember your promise? I had no sooner said this when a brilliant orb as bright as the moon burst forth from the direction of Inoshima, shooting across the sky from southeast to northwest. It was shortly before dawn and still too dark to see anyone's face, but the radiant object clearly illuminated everyone like bright moonlight. The executioner fell on his face, his eyes blinded. The soldiers were terrified and panic-stricken. Some ran off into the distance, some jumped from there. Horses and knelt on the ground, and others crouched down in their saddles. I called out, Here, why do you shrink from this miserable prisoner? Come nearer, come closer, but no one would approach. What if the dawn should break? You must hasten to execute me, for you will find it unbearable to do so after sunrise. I urged them on, but they made no response. They waited a short time, and then someone requested that I proceed to Echi in the same province of Sagami. I replied that since none of us knew the way, someone would have to guide us there. No one was willing to lead the way, but after we had waited for a while, one soldier finally said, that is the road you must take. Setting off, we followed the road and by noon reached Echi. We then proceeded to the residence of Homa Rokorozaman. There I ordered sake for the soldiers. When the time came for them to leave, some bowed their heads, joined their hands as though in prayer, and said in a most respectful manner, we did not realize what kind of person you are. We hated you because we were told that you slandered Amida Buddha, whom we worship. But now that we have seen your greatness with our own eyes, we will discard the Nebutsu that we have practiced for so long. Some of them even took their Nebutsu rosaries from their tinder bags and flung them away. Others pledged that they would never again chant the Nebutsu. After they left, Rokorozaman's retainers took over the guard. Then Shio Kingo and his brothers departed. That evening, at the hour of the dog, 7 to 9 p.m., a messenger from Kamakura arrived with a decree from the regent. The soldiers were sure that it would be an order to behead me. Yumanojo, Homa's magistrate, came running with the letter, knelt, and said, We were fearful that you would be executed tonight but now this letter has brought wonderful news. The messenger said that since the Lord of Musashi had left for a spa in Atami this morning at the hour of the hare, 5 to 7 a.m., he rode four hours to get here directly because he feared that something might happen to you. The messenger will leave immediately to take this message to the Lord of Atami tonight. The accompanying letter read, This person is not guilty. He will shortly be pardoned. If you execute him, you will have cause to regret.